All right. Welcome back. Um, I hope everybody had a relaxing winter break. Again, my apologies for the, um, the technical glitches and whatnot regarding the manual purchase. Um, I want to mention a couple of things right off the bat about that because the last thing I want you to do is to be penalized for technical hiccups that were completely outside your control. So um, if you had me last semester for structural analysis or last year, um, this class is going to be operated in very much the same fashion uh, as those courses. And what I'm going to be doing is tweaking the assignments and the work for the first two weeks such that you don't need a manual, okay? Because I'm not going to hold that to you, okay? Now, if week three comes around and you still don't have the manual, we'll revisit some things then. But I'm not going to hold you to, to task for not having the manual because of technical hiccups. Does, is that fair? Right? Okay with that? Okay. Um, my office hours are right here, but um, you all know, actually I think that, that there's some slight updates to that already. Day one, I've got some mistakes and whatnot. We'll have to add that to the tally. I think I, I did my office hours as 12 to 2. But anyways, whatever's on the syllabus uh, is accurate. What I'm most interested in today beyond discussing the, um, the syllabus and whatnot for the course, is I want to discuss, uh, I want to mention one other thing. Uh, if you have not yet completed your return to campus agreement for this semester, you need to do so and do it now. Um, I know that there's, I think, one student in this class that hasn't done it yet. Um, you run the risk of your in-class in uh, courses being administratively withdrawn if you haven't done that yet. Um, but most of our students in our college have done it. I, if, if, if you have gotten uh, angry emails from me this morning, you haven't done it. If not, then you know, you're good. The, the email has uh, the link to do it. It takes five seconds. Just, you know, I'll just make sure and do that. Okay, um, in terms of how this course is operated, um, uh, I'm, I'm decided to operate this uh, uh, basically the same way I have uh, in previous years. So I'm going to uh, have the grade for the attendance, the homework, uh, and the three exams. The exam weights are not identical. Okay, so exam two is not worth as much as the final, and exam one sort of in the middle. There, there are reasons for that. One of the things that I have said uh, uh, throughout all of my, my courses is that I don't for the most part, other than maybe statics, I don't intend for my exams to be comprehensive, okay? Um, and if there's any one class that I feel I can truly deliver on that promise, it's in here. Steel design is a very modular course. You learn topic A, and then you learn topic B, and then you learn topic C. And there's very little that, that, that uh, transfers between the two. There are some concepts like gross and net area and whatnot, and some details about bolts and whatnot that transfer over. But for instance, um, let's take tension members and compression members. So tension members are where you take a piece of steel and yank on it, and compression members are where you take a piece of steel and you push on it. The way that you analyze and design those members are completely different. They're, they're, they're in terms of the math, how you use the manual, the equation, they're not even the same thing. So I can, de I can delineate you know, columns on one exam and tension members are on another. And so the way the grade distribution is set up, the, the topics have a way of neatly dividing themselves. And so exam two just doesn't have as much on it. So exam one is going to be all of the introductory stuff and then our first major concept or topic, which are tension members. Exam two focuses on connections. So exam two focuses on bolted connections and welded connections. Exam three focuses on columns and beams. So columns and beams are, are kind of a big topic in the course. That's why that, that uh, exam is just worth a little bit more. It's not me saying that the exam is more important. It's just the way the topics kind of shake out. It just There's a little bit more on that exam than, than some of the others. Um, let me go ahead and pull up the syllabus just to kind of formally go through it. Um, let me end this show. Oh, wrong button. <clears throat> okay, so here's the syllabus for the course. Uh, I'm not going to go through prereqs and, and things like that because um, you, I mean, you're already in here and whatnot. Um, there are a couple things in the syllabus that I think are worth mentioning. Um, so for instance, um, one of the things that I discussed 
we have our, our um, the catalog description and whatnot, and then we have sort of the course overview. One of the things I will say about this class is that it has, while I operate it uh, in, in a similar fashion uh, that I do uh, structural analysis, it has an incredibly different feel to it. Um, I, I, I love teaching structural analysis. It, it's, it's one of my, my favorite courses to teach. But one of the, I guess, downsides of that course is that there's very little that you can sink your teeth into at the end of the day with some of the problems. Like you do this big uh, uh, moment diagram problem and you get this funky little shape and the maximum moment is 350 foot kips. It's like, all right, what do I do with that? You know, it, it's, it, there's an abstraction, there's a theoretical abstraction to, to structural analysis that's kind of hard to get past. You know, it's, you, know you do the, the problem and you get x equals four. It's like, what does that mean? That is certainly not the case with, with a lot of the stuff that we do in this course because the answers at the end of the day are stuff that you can sink your teeth into. The answer is use three quarter inch diameter bolts, use 12 of them, spaced at three inches with edge distances of two inches, et cetera. You're actually designing the connection, selecting the members. It's, it's real deal stuff at the end of the day. So it feels much more real world maybe than, than structural analysis does in that instance. I mean, you're still using principles of structural analysis to design, but the answers at the end of the day are much more tangible maybe uh, than they were in structural analysis. There are two methods uh, that we can predominantly use to design structures. One of them is allowable stress design. The other is load and resistance factor design or LRFD. We are an LRFD course. We're going to be using LRFD throughout the semester. If you happen to have your manual and you just start flipping through it, you will see a lot of colored pages that look like this. The manual actually accommodates both design philosophies, LRFD or the blue numbers, uh, ASD or the green numbers. We use the blue numbers. I'll talk a, a little bit more about that on Friday, um, but that's, uh, that, that's just something that's worth mentioning. I'm going to talk about kind of what it mean, what, what design even means uh, a little bit later today. Uh, let's see, communication policy. This is all the same stuff from last semester, same stuff from last semester. Again, my, my, it, you know, for those of you that had me last semester, which is the vast majority of you, you know how I operate my course, and not really much is going to be any different. And if you had me last year for virtual structural analysis, a lot of the, um, the, the methods and procedures that I um, accommodated or that I adopted then, I'm still using. So, for instance, the, the daily homework assignment uh, gig and whatnot, which by and large has been, been pretty well received uh, in the course. So, a little bit about the, the timeline for the course. So. Um, here's our sort of draft schedule, uh, if you will. Um, so this week we're going to be sort of laying the, the, the foundation, if you will, for the fundamentals of steel design. So we're going to be talking today about what structural design even means, introducing you to some concepts like limit states uh, and whatnot. And then Wednesday and Friday we'll talk a little bit more about uh, allowable stress design versus LRFD, why LRFD is a little bit of a better approach. Uh, and then Friday, we're, we'll specifically be talking about the manual. And I know the manual um, hasn't come in for a number of you uh, yet, but uh, I'll, I'll get into that uh, uh, here in a little bit. Once we come back from the holiday, we basically are in our first main module of the course, which is tension members. And we take it one step at a time in order to define that. So we actually spend about three or four lectures just looking at the various components that you need to understand to analyze and design tension members. Like, how do you compute gross and net area? How do you compute shear lag factors? How do you compute slenderness uh, and whatnot? Once we uh, get past that, then we can get into analysis and design and then uh, handle some, some uh, you know, sort of topic related stuff near the end like block shear and threaded rods. Our first exam is scheduled for Friday, uh, uh, February 11th. We're going to do it the same way that we've done in uh, my previous courses. We'll have an exam review session on Wednesday. Exam will be on Friday. One thing that I'll probably do differently this semester, um, and I'll tell you why, is I'm probably going to do paper-based exams as opposed to the laptops and whatnot. I'll tell you why. Um, I ran into a little bit of a kerfuffle in statics because I got a question. They said, so our statics final is two hours long, and we're concerned our batteries on our laptops aren't going to last that long. And, and it, it was in uh, Smith Hall 154, and the, uh, 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 there weren't as many outlets as are on here. And I know that's not an issue, but honestly, I was grading 
60 comprehensive static exams. It was actually a little easier to just do the paper-based grading. I, I kind of thought that the computer-based grading would be easier, but it really didn't turn out that way. So I, I think that in the end, the one thing about paper-based exams is that there's, um, there's, there's no internet connection issue with paper. You know, so I, I think that won't be an issue. We'll discuss format and whatnot later, but I wanted to mention that. Now, the, the second exam is going to be Wednesday, March 9th. So Monday, we'll have the review. Wednesday, we'll have the exam. Friday, we'll have a makeup day. And so if we're behind or anything, we'll use that day. Otherwise, class is canceled. Then you have spring break. And then after spring break, we spend the remainder of the course on our two remaining uh, topics, columns and beams. Uh, we'll have our exam during, you know, the regular or the exam time slot. Whew. What do you think? Any questions about how the course is operated? I mean, if you, like I said, if you've had me for class before, it's not really going to be anything that's any different. I did call the ball on a project, and I kind of decided to uh, uh, veer against the project. And, and I'll tell you why. Um, the way the course is laid out, the homeworks might get to be a little bit longer than in structures. And I don't, I, I don't know, I, I'm, I haven't decided yet how I want to structure it because I don't want to pile more work on you than I did last semester. It's just sort of where, where my issue. Like some of the homeworks just might be a little bit longer. I don't want you to have to worry about a project and that throughout the semester. And there's, there's not a lot I can do about that in some of these regards because steel design just is a very detailed process. There's not, there's not a lot I can change there. So. Any questions? All right, let's talk a little bit about um, about uh, what the heck it is we're doing in here. Um, I'm going to skip a lot of the stuff about. Uh, well, actually, no. Let's let's not do that. Uh, let let's go through some of this. So, um, Blackboard. I do use Blackboard. You know, you all know I use that pretty frequently for grade posting and whatnot. I don't know. Has anybody gotten on Blackboard this morning or today? It's got a fresh coat of paint, doesn't it? It looks different. Um, the university updated their Blackboard module. So that you're aware, it actually operates the same way. Um, but it just, I don't know, you'll have to log on to see. It's just different. You know, it ha it, it's aesthetically different. The way that you access courses is a little different. Instead of just clicking the link, there's like a, like a window thing that pops up. Um, it's just different. So that, that, that's all I would say. Um, cam scanner, uh, I use cam scanner and whatnot. Uh, I, I suggest using cam scanner to submit homework assignments and whatnot. For the first week, your homework assignments, and we don't have a homework assignment today, so don't worry about that. But for the first week, your homework assignments are going to, instead of being uploading a, um, a document, they're going to be sort of like tests on Blackboard. They're not timed tests and whatnot. But you'll understand what I mean. Uh, like the first assignment and uh, deals with LRFD load combinations. And basically, I'm just going to give you a series of loads and have you factor them and get the factored load. And all you have to do is enter the factored load, and, uh, and, and that'll be it. You'll understand what I mean uh, when we talk about that on Wednesday. But for the first week, I've set it up to where there's not really a grading aspect that I need to do. You just do the assignment, and you know, you'll get the credit. You'll, you'll understand what I mean. Um, but later on, uh, scanners and whatnot will probably uh, be necessary. Um, I do use Teams for um, uh, for backup for live lectures if needed. So if for some reason we're all snowed in or whatnot, um, uh, that that you know I, I uh, we have that. And I do use Teams for periodic class communication. If you haven't installed the Teams app, I really would um, because it really is uh, pretty b uh, beneficial. Uh, at a minimum, I am going to use the class notebook like I did last semester, and that's going to be where all the computations uh, are done. Um, and then I have your break your smartphones out for attendance, but I did that early because of all the um, uh, the technical glitches with the manual. Um, I will log the attendance on Blackboard. I'll try and do that pretty frequently, and I am going to still use the uh, method where I record the lectures, post them to YouTube, uh, et cetera. Um, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now um, that uh, Friday's lecture is going to be pre-recorded. Okay, we are not going to meet in person on Friday. Okay, um, our call we have our college meeting uh, on Friday, uh, and the university president is going to be there. I kind of got to be there too, so um, I will pre-record that lecture. But that if there's any one lecture that we pre-record, that's actually probably a pretty good one. 
Uh, in that lecture, what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss the manual. I'm going to discuss like how it's laid out. I'm going to give you an assignment, and the only purpose of the assignment is to sort of force you to open the manual and look up some values. But I'm not going to make that one assignment due until week three, because again, I don't want you to be penalized for you know, technical glitches and shipping issues with the manual and whatnot. So I'm definitely going to give you some, uh, uh, some time on that. Any questions? Finally, on the, the homework assignment uh, standpoint, um, I'm going to assign the homework during lecture. It'll be due the next lecture, typically due at the beginning of next lecture, sometimes maybe not. Um, you all know the drill on formatting and whatnot. Um, you all can read through that. I'm not going to waste your time uh, on that. Um, okay. Let's get into some actual stuff about steel design. But before I do, any questions? Okay. Let's talk about structural design. Um, what, I mean, obviously this class is, you know, named structural steel design. So, you know, talking about design might be a good place to start. But beyond the name of the course, I, I, I want to talk about design because I don't know if it's really been sort of conveyed that way to you, but that's what engineers do, okay? Look, everybody in this room has decided that they want to be a civil engineer. And I, you know, if I'm, if I'm discussing with a potential student or maybe a parent of a high school student interested in engineering and they ask, like, what do engineers do? I say they solve problems. And that's the truth. Um, engineers use the principles of math and science to solve real world issues. And then civil engineers, you know, just solve specific types of problems. Just, you know, mechanical engineers, they solve problems related to machines and thermo and fluids and stuff like that. We obviously know what type of problems electrical engineers deal with, with like power and communications and signals and so on and so forth. And then there's civil engineers and they deal with problems related to the built infrastructure. And we talk about, you know, the types of projects that, that um, civil engineers deal with. They deal with bridges and roads and dams and all that. But what does that mean? Like solve problems. What are you talking about? What does that mean? What does it mean to solve problems related to bridges? They design them. That's what that means. Okay. You have a, 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 a road, you have a bridge. If you know the bridge is going to be 80 foot long because that's how long the, that's how wide the river is. It's got to cross it. What does that mean? It means designing the bridge, selecting the beam, sizing the beam such that it can safely resist the load. It means that selecting elements that it performs the way that we want it to. Design, what do civil engineers do? They evaluate, design, rehabilitate, or retrofit infrastructure related systems. That's what we do. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about that design process. Okay. Now, so what is structural engineering? It might seem a little late to talk about this now after we've had a course in structural analysis and you're in this elective uh, uh, issue here, but I kind of want to put maybe a little bit of a mathematical bent to this so that you can kind of understand what I'm talking about. Now, if you look up some Wikipedia-based definition on what structural engineering is, it's going to give you some, you know, sentence like this, that structural engineering is the science and art of designing structures so that they can safely resist the, uh, the forces that they're subjected to. Now, structural engineers, one of the things that you'll find in, in our, our field is that we tend to have a pretty sharp line of division between the types of projects that we work on. And civil or and structural engineers tend to work on two types of projects, either buildings or bridges. Now, don't get me wrong, there are, you know, there are outliers to stuff like that. You know, there's stuff in the electrical industry or in the mining industry or, or you know, I, I could, industrial industry, I could find, you know, exceptions to that rule. I, I could. But generally, the, the vast majority of work that structural engineers do tend to get split up into two different areas, buildings and bridges. Now, there are behavioral aspects that are common to both. A steel beam doesn't really care whether or not it's used for a building or used for a bridge. It's going to kind of behave the same way. Um, so one of the things that you will find is that if you open up the bridge spec and compare it to what's in the building spec, you're going to find a lot of similarities, a lot of the same variables and same expressions and same equations, uh, et cetera. You are going to find some differences, though. You're going to find certain parameters that are important in bridges that aren't in buildings and vice versa. Now, so that everybody is, is aware and crystal clear, we are uh, teaching this course and operating this course based on the AISC Steel Construction Manual. 
And this manual is intended to be geared towards the design of buildings, of building structures, okay? But that doesn't mean that if you're passionate about bridges or something like that, that everything that we're learning is useless. That's absolutely not the case. Facts are that the, the specs have been written and aligned in such a way that if you understand building design, that a lot of the stuff that's in the bridge design specification is very, very similar. But I just wanted to put that out there that, that our specs and methods are, are largely uh, focused on buildings in this course. But what is that? What, what are we talking about? What does this mean? Let's go back to square one. I propose that the basis of structural design can be delineated or described by looking at two sides of the equation. On one end, we need to look at the loads that our structure must hold up. So a good example or a good thought process would be to look at the Weisberg Applied Engineering Complex. So what are some of the loads and forces that this structure needs to be able to, to withstand? Well, at a minimum, it needs to be able to hold itself up, right? This is not a light as a feather complex, right? It's pretty heavy, right? Buildings are heavy. They have to be strong enough to support their own self-weight, okay? That's one. What about occupancy, live load? We talked a little bit about this last semester when we talked about influence lines, but there is um, a difference between the permanent force effects that are always there and then the transient force effects that move. And some of, some of the parameters that define those transient force effects are what the building's used for. This is a school facility. We are in a classroom. This classroom has a different occupancy live load than the hallways do, right? We talked about this last semester, how the hallways tend to have heavier loads, right? Because there's a more dense concentration of people in there. Remember that? Kind of the you know, same idea here. There are also a series of environmental force effects that buildings need to be able to, to withstand. Uh, for example, what do you think this building needed to withstand last week? The snow, right? Has to be able to uh, withstand snow loads. And those snow loads are going to change dependent upon where we're at in the United States, right? We're going to have different snow loads here in West Virginia than we are in Alaska or that we are in Miami, right? What about wind, right? One of the things you'll find in structural engineering is that wind design gets more complicated the taller the building gets. Wind design for Smith Hall is a lot more challenging than wind design for this building because Smith Hall is taller. Wind loads tend to get parabolically worse as the structure gets taller, right? So it's not 100% uh, accurate, but it's pretty close. Um, there's a fifth common force effect that, that uh, structural engineers need to deal with, although we don't need to really deal with it in Huntington, West Virginia, but we might if we were in, say, LA. What's that? Earthquakes. Yeah, we don't have to deal with that so much here in uh, West Virginia, but if we were in a seismically active zone, we have to consider earthquakes. So, those are all the loads and whatnot that structures have to hold up. And I mean, we, there's obviously some more, you know, uh, other issues, ice and ponding and things like that. But that's kind of the, you know, the gist of it. Now, on the flip side, there's the resistance. And that's actually what we're going to spend a lot of time in this course focused on is the resistance of, of given structural elements. Here is a bolt. How much force can that particular bolt withstand before it fails? Here is a column. How much load can it support before it buckles, right, et cetera, right? So if we wanted to apply a little bit of a mathematical bent to this, ultimately what we need to do is size and proportion structures and structural systems such that the resistance is greater than or equal to the loads, right? Assuming that we've accounted for uncertainties and factors of safety and things like that, okay? Now, if that's the case, let me paint a scenario for you. Let's say I'm a structural engineer in the Huntington, West Virginia area, and I need to design a bridge carrying traffic on 3rd Avenue. It, it, it doesn't matter. I just want to pick a street that gets traveled a lot. And I know that when this bridge is completed and it's in service, that that bridge is going to be used a lot by my grandma. She's going to drive on that bridge every day to check the mail and go to the grocery store. And I'm not going to have anything happen to grandma. I don't know about you, but... No, Alejandro would not tolerate that. Had to bring up Alejandro. So I decide nothing's going to happen to Grandma. I'm making that bridge massive, large, deep beams, heavy connections, so that it's safe. Nothing's going to happen. 
What's the problem with that strategy? It's too expensive. That's exactly right. That's way too expensive. See, this is where things get challenging in our profession. Okay, Managing the tightrope between safety and economy. ASCE Canon of Ethics, Provision 1, states, Canon 1, that the safety welfare of the general public is our first and foremost concern. Okay? We cannot design or proportion systems that are going to fail. Right? We just can't do that. Right? But there is a big difference between an efficiently and economically designed bridge and one that's ridiculously large. They're, bo they're, both, <laughs> they're both safe. They're both uh, definitely meeting the, the provisions of Canon 1, but I would argue that they're, they're not satisfying our client because we have a duty to our client as well. Now, in the case of a bridge design, who's our client? Everybody, right? The state, the, the, the Department of Highways or the Division of, of Highways and whatnot. Um, the, the state, and particularly the taxpayer, are the ones who are our client, which that's another reason why bridges and buildings tend to get handled a little differently because your client changes, right? If you're designing bridges, your client is the state, but if you're designing buildings, your client is most often a, a private entity, right? If I'm designing a... Um, uh, uh, corporate headquarters for Geico, right? The Gecko says he, he, he needs a new uh, uh, office complex. We're working for Geico, which actually that's not even accurate. If you're in the um, uh, building design system, a lot of times you are just a cog in the entire building delivery engine. You, you might report to the architect. The architect might report to the developer. The developer might report to Geico. So, you know, you're just a, a, a small entity uh, in that regard. So, just a little bit of a different world, not just from a design standpoint, but from a uh, uh, business management standpoint as well, I would say. So that idea, that tightrope of safety versus economy is what makes our job challenging. Okay. Now, a lot of what we do in structural steel design, and this is true in reinforced concrete design, this is true in in any design process is we tend to define this concept called a limit state. Okay? Now, what is a limit state? A limit state is a condition that we as the engineering community have defined as, as an important co uh, condition for the structure to achieve. And if we violate that condition, then we say the structure has no longer uh, uh, meet its you know, relevant design criteria. So as an example, um, a common limit state might be buckling of a column, right? So we compute how much load it takes to buckle the column, and then we just make sure that that load is bigger than how much force we're putting on it. Because if our, the amount of force we're putting on it exceeds the buckling capacity of the column, that structure is no longer meeting its design criteria because the column's buckled, the structure's going to fall down and kill somebody, right? Now, we generally tend to define two different types of limit states uh, in structural engineering. Uh, we call the, uh, and we define them in sort of two classes. One of them are strength limit states, which admittedly we spend most of our time trying to understand strength limit states in this course. But then there's also a, a whole other class of, of limit states related to serviceability. We call those service limit states. Um, and so there's going to be differences in how we deal with strength limit states versus service limit states. So here's what I mean. Strength limit states tend to reflect failure, right? If you violate this limit state, the bolts are snapping in half. The column is buckling. The, the welds are failing. The structure is going to fall down and kill somebody. And so we tend to apply load and resistance factors to those limit states because of what they represent. If we violate this, the structure's going to fall down and kill somebody. But in service limit states, we tend to not apply those safety factors because they that's not what they represent. Um, if you violate a service limit state, that doesn't mean the structure is going to fall down and kill somebody, but it doesn't mean you want to violate it either. You still have to meet those design criteria. A common service limit state that we will deal with in this course is deflection limitations. So not only must we uh, select beams 
that are strong enough to resist the loads. We don't want them to fail under the applied loads, but they have to be stiff enough. Their moment of inertia has to be large enough so they don't deflect too much. Why is that? Well, I'll give you an example. Um, a common deflection limit is L over 360. Now, how many of you have ever been in a, I think I mentioned this example last semester, but how many of you have ever been in a building that had a plastered ceiling, plastered roof? If you start violating L over 360, the plaster starts to crack. Now, that doesn't mean the structure's going to fall down and kill somebody, right? But it's certainly not a desirable or, uh, um, uh, um, it's, it's not a condition we can ignore as structural engineers. There is a big uh, difference between limit states that represent the failure of a component or a system and limit states that represent the day-to-day -day performance of the structure. Things like deformation, we don't want it to deflect too much. If we were talking about concrete design, there are limit states related to limiting cracking uh, in the beam. There's uh, uh, um, limit states related to slip of fasteners. And that's going to be something we talk about with bolted connections, whether or not we deal with bearing type connections or slip critical connections. So I'm getting into the weeds of stuff we're going to deal with later on in the semester. Motion. Um, there are limit states related to, and we won't, I'll be honest, we won't talk about them a lot in here, but there are limit states related to how much a floor system can vibrate, okay? Because, um, in addition to the structure being you know, safe uh, and secure, we want to maintain user comfort. We want to limit human discomfort. If you've ever been in a floor system where the floor is vibrating, you feel a little weird, right? That's, that's not very comfortable, right? So um, we, we want to, uh, to, to limit that uh, component as well. All right, so what are our objectives when designing structures, designing structures, okay? So obviously we want to, size the components such that they um, achieve uh, you know, their, their target outcome. But beyond safety and, 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 uh, uh, and serviceability and whatnot, there are a couple of other things we need to consider. Number one, aesthetics. Um, usually in building design land, the structural engineer works in tandem with the architect and the client to ensure that the, the structure um, fulfills the need of the client and still uh, uh, achieves their desired outcome. Architects tend to want super large open spaces with no columns anywhere. And then the structural engineer says, so if you don't have columns, the building's going to fall down and kill somebody. So the structural engineer wants columns. The architect doesn't. And so there's a, a middle ground that you need to meet. Um, another thing that we need to consider as structural engineers is the constructability of a given system. Um, it does not do for our client to produce a system that isn't even able to be constructed. Um, and there are uh, a number of areas where that matters. First off, you know, we have to design and detail connections such that the bolts aren't too close together uh, and that they're easily accessible. Um, one of the things that you'll find uh, in certain systems, like, and this happens in both bridges and buildings, is that sometimes the worst case stresses on the system are not at the end of the day when the structure is complete. They're actually during construction. For instance, um, whenever you have long span beams that uh, are going to be supporting a concrete slab, typically we'll have shear studs welded on the top of the beam such that when the concrete cures, the concrete beam and the slab act together. They act compositely. How many of you have ever been on a DOH construction site and see what I'm talking about? There's uh, the steel beam has, the, they look like thick looking nails welded to the top of the beam. Sometimes concrete beams have little loops sticking out on the top of them. How many of y'all have seen those know what I'm talking about? All right. Well, the idea is that when the concrete cures, the slab and the beam act together. But before that happens, the beam has to be able to hold up eight inches of wet concrete all by itself. Sometimes those stresses are more than the stresses at the end of the day. Uh, and so that's one of the things I mean by constructability, not just assessing the beam at the end of the day, but assessing it throughout the construction process. Obviously, economy is the resulting structure efficient and economical. And, and, we're, and there's a number of ways that, that economy can, can present itself. It's, so in, in the, the project that we did last semester, we were just looking at lightest weight. Okay? How many of you presented trusses that had like six or seven or eight or nine different member sizes? 
right? Now, let's go to the real world. What if you just use the same member size for all those trusses, for all those members? Makes it easier for the project manager to order and seal, right? Makes it easier on them. Uh, if you use the same connection pattern, makes it easier for the fabricators. And so maybe the lightest weight member for every single element in the system isn't the most efficient design, isn't the most economic design. There are considerations that you as an engineer need to account for when you look at stuff like this. This is the first time I've taught steel design after that project. After that project. And I love this slide to sort of close things out because I think that now this point is made much more clear. It's much more prescient in your heads after that project that we did in structural analysis. So if you remember that class project that we did in structural analysis, I gave you some project constraints and I said lay out a truss, select the members, do the deflection criteria, revise the member selection if necessary, draw it up, etc. This plot over here on the left is the ability to influence cost of a project over time. And so at the very, very beginning, during the conceptual planning phase, during the initial design phase, you have a lot of ability to influence the cost and influence the delivery of that project. But by the time you're fabricating and erecting and installing the structure and startup, there's not really much you can do. It is what it is, right? project is what it is. And, and I think a lot of you probably understood that as you were going through that trust design or that, that trust layout. Because if I went to you at the tail end, you were drawing everything up and I said, yeah, I'm going to need you to redo that trust. What if I said that like two days before the project was due? Would I have any air in my tires when I went to the parking lot? No, right? Because now, I want you to look at the other uh, uh, plot. This is how much change costs over time. At the beginning of that trust project, it didn't cost that much money to change your mind. Like when you were going through the conceptual design phase, like you were just tossing around ideas, right? But then you picked one and you ran with it, right? If we're putting the roof, 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 I'm from West Virginia, so I guess I say roof. Um, when you're putting the roof on a structure and the engineer calls the contractor and said, yeah, we got to redo the foundation. Excuse me? I need a lot of money at the end of the day to do that because you're basically telling me to start over, right? I want you to just sort of keep some of this stuff in your head. Um, the ability to influence the cost of a project over time and how much it would cost to implement those changes as the project nears completion. So I think that you kind of need to have this stuff in your head. While you might not have seen these graphs before, I kind of think you understood these graphs before we started here. And I'm not saying it's just because of the project that we did in structural analysis, but I think that this is important. And, and one of the other things, I don't have this on a slide, but one of the things I definitely want to impress upon you is I think you're really going to enjoy this class. There's a lot of really good um, uh, uh, systemic thinking that you'll develop from this class. You'll learn a lot of real world stuff. You'll learn how to dissect a real world specification. Because the steel manual, I'm going to tell you right now, this is not the, 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 the only specification document you are going to have to navigate in your careers. And I don't care what you do. I don't care if you go down environmental land, geotech land, what have you. You're going to spend your careers navigating spec documents. I have a whole lecture dedicated just to understanding how these documents work. Um, uh, but, and, 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 and I kind of want to make sure that we're clear on this. A lot of what we do in here um, has much more profound impacts than just well, how much do I add to the bolt diameter for this bolt to get the whole diameter? And, and, and what shear lag factor do I use and why? I do want you to understand that like what we do in here has very serious, profound impacts. I mean, um, I'm going to tell you a story later on in the semester about the Kansas City Hyatt uh, Regency walkway. How many of you have heard of this before? This was the worst structural failure in American history under its design load. It's not like, you know, um, 
something like 9-11 or Oklahoma City where they were definitely extreme events. This was normal operating procedures and over 100 people lost their lives. And so not only is what we do, I think, fun and exciting, and I think you can definitely tether this to the, the end goal of your careers. You want to be civil engineers? This is civil engineering, okay? Um, but I, I just think it's worth mentioning, and I don't want to like end the class on a somber note, but I just want everybody to recognize that what we're also doing is very important in the aspect of ensuring the safety, health, and welfare of the public uh, and whatnot. Any questions? All right. I do not have a homework assignment for you today. I want to talk a little bit about what we're going to do for the next couple of weeks. Or, sorry, yeah, for the next couple of weeks. So Wednesday, what we're going to do Wednesday is I mentioned this concept, LRFD. I think you kind of have a general understanding of the goal of design, the idea that we have to uh, proportion our members such that the resistance is greater than or equal to the loads. I really want to get into the nitty gritty of what that means on Wednesday. Now Friday. Friday we are not going to be in person. This is what I'm going to do on Friday. I'm going to pre-record a video and I'm going to, in that video, discuss this. I'm going to discuss the manual. Now, I know that you might be still waiting on the manual. I get that. Okay. The homework associated with that lecture is not going to be due until week three. So the idea is that whenever your manual comes in, watch this lecture, do that homework, you'll see what I mean. It's very simple. I'm literally asking you questions like, tell me what the flange thickness is for this shape. And you just have to look it up and type it in. It, it's pretty simple. But I think it's a perfect lecture to pre-record given what we've been dealing with with the, uh, the technical issues surrounding the manual. When we come back in week two, we're going to begin the discussion of tension members, but we're going to take it slow. We're going to start with how to compute areas, gross areas, net areas, parallel bolt pass, staggered bolt pass. By then, I'm thinking that most of your manual should arrive. In the meantime, turn your spam, make sure you check your spam folders, your junk folders and whatnot. I will be sending an email to AISC with those of you that indicated on the, the, the sign-in sheet that you still need the manual, that you tried, that you didn't get it. That's all I've got. I will see you all on Wednesday.